Welcome to the GMI Hub Online. Today we are going to be talking to a lawyer about entertainment lawying, lawyering. How do you pronounce that? Anyway, so it's going to be a great show as we have Paul Sanderson and uh, Cheryl, can you tell us a bit about him? Or maybe Paul, you could just explain to us who you are and what you do. I'm Cheryl Duick, and I and I thank you viewers for being with us. This is going to be an, an awesome conversation because if you are an artist, and let me let me just ask you this: If you've had situations where you have recorded music, and when you wanted to get tracks, you weren't able to get them because for some reason the producer ran away or seemed to disappear off the face of the earth, mm -hmm. or you have something similar to that, um, maybe you you were in a partnership situation and somehow that partnership fell through, or maybe you didn't get the royalties you deserve. Well. This is the reason we're having this conversation. We have Paul Sanderson, who is seems to be the entertainment lawyer of Ontario. Um, he has been serving the entertainment world, and not just music, but music and the arts, for 37 years. So this man knows what he's talking about. He is the sole owner of Sanderson Law, and um, he's also an author, author not an author, <laughs> an author of uh, musicians and law in Canada. Um, and he's an instructor at Metalworks who talks about law. So we wanna say welcome <laughs> to Thank Paul. You. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Uh, uh, the only thing I might wanna add to, to that introduction, and thank you, Cheryl and Dale, um, this may be very helpful to your, uh, your, your audience. Uh, we all know that lawyers in the private bar, which I do, I run my own firm, can get expensive. And there are lots of musicians out there that are in startup positions or don't have the funds. I'm also the co-founder of Artist Legal Advice Services, which has been going since 1986. That's 35 years. And I like, I take a lot of pride in that because it's a legacy of giving back to the community in addition to the teaching, in addition to the writing, the books, et cetera, the lecturing. But anyone can book uh, an appointment, and we've been doing them online since this, obviously, this whole COVID situation. We operate between 5.30 and 7 currently, two nights a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays. And you can book a half-hour appointment with a lawyer that has expertise in arts and entertainment field, and it is on a pro bono basis. So I, I like to think that everyone that needs access has the opportunity to get some advice, if even on a, what they call a summary advice basis. And sometimes that's all you need, or sometimes it's a, just a good way to get directed and say, do you really need to hire a lawyer? Where do I go next with it? So that's alasontario.ca. Look it up, um, I'm very proud of it. There's, we have a great board. We have 10 lawyers on the board some of whom are, uh, like myself, experts in their own given field, whether it be film, whether it be book publishing, whether it be video games, intellectual property. It's just a great board and we've been doing it for a long time and we're very active and I take a lot of pride in that. So. Was alas.com did you say? Uh, no, it's alasontario.ca. Okay, great. So let me make sure everybody's heard that. Alasontario.ca. You want yes. to check that out? Fantastic. Yeah. So if you want to scoot on over there and take a look at what resources we have online there too, I just actually just uh, contributed an article to the website called Creating, which is a bit of a mini checklist if you're looking to enter into a license agreement, mm -hmm. any type of license agreement, a rights agreement, artist. So that might be a good place to start. It's called. C R E A T I N G. <laughs> it's an acronym for uh, for the checklist you might be looking at in relation to, uh, particularly license agreements. Wow, which happens a lot in the music industry mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and entertainment generally. Yeah. So let, let's let's go into um, how does uh, what does an entertainment lawyer do? What what is it that you kind of do? <clears throat> That's a very good question. Um, I would say a good 85% of what we do is contract based, both drafting, uh, negotiating, and of course, uh, advising, counseling on contracts. Uh, the rest of my practice tends to be of what they would call the corporate nature. So if you look looking at a incorporation, 
a name registration, a business name registration, a partnership registration, a partnership agreement. Um, and I also um, am what's called a trademark agent. Not all lawyers are, but I find it goes very well with the, what they call the solicitor to base practice that I have. So um, we do uh, Canadian trademark uh, registrations uh, at the Canadian Intellectual Property Office. I've been doing that for many decades as well. So those would be, I guess, the three main areas that we do, but most of it is contract driven. Um, so we do what is called some quasi litigious work, which means partially litigious. If it, if it's uh, something that um, is in dispute, uh, we may be sending a demand letter and attempting a settlement. If, it, if we can't settle it, then it makes sense. Then it goes over to a barrister and it goes into court. And I, I do, I take a lot of pride in that too. Uh, from, from my perspective, staying out of court is a good thing. Uh, negotiated settlements are much more certain. Court is very uncertain. It's expensive, both uh, emotionally and financially and psychologically for that matter. So if you can avoid court, probably best to do that. On the other hand, that's what it's there for. And if you need it, I look at it as kind of a you know, sort of in quotes, a last resort. But we do some of that too. Yeah, yeah. It's a very stressful situation, I'm sure. Um, yeah, yeah. And contracts can t be too. If, if, mm -hmm. if some of the hotly contested contracts can feel like you're in court and you're nowhere the near in court. So if they get <laughs> substantially negotiated and yeah, well, you know, it, every contract that I've seen with an artist, it's often the only offer they get. And, mm -hmm. and it's, a, it's a very stressful time to, to move from unsigned into signed and say, well, this is a, I like to use the analogy, is this a snake or is it a ladder? Right. Is it going to yeah. build your career yeah. or is it going to be a problem later on? You don't really know until you try. So that's, mm -hmm. we deal with that too. So, I mean, the, yes, as an entertainment lawyer, you also have to understand, uh, well, the people in the industry, I think that's important, the relationship in the industry, but you also need to know the music business itself as well or better than your clients. So you can advise on them, not just in relation to the contracts, but how they work in relation to the field, which is, as you can see, especially with this year, it's just, it's, it's, it's a rapidly changing field. It always has been, but I think even more so now that we've been jettisoned into cyberspace, everything online, it's complicated things. It's, it's again, like as always with change, it creates opportunity, it creates yeah. crisis, it creates some people are going to win, some people are going to lose in that. Uh, through this COVID situation, have you found that there's less um, uh, of being people approaching you? <coughs> there, has it affected the I mean, this changed everything as far as entertainers are concerned. So I wonder how it changes your, your role. Uh, yes and no. Uh, the good news is uh, we don't deal a lot with uh, on the live performance side, which obviously has been very, very hard hit. Mm -hmm. We often are putting deals together on the production side. So has that stopped? No, if anything, it's probably increased because people are at home. They work in their studios at home. They're songwriting. They're collaborating. All that hasn't gone away. Some things have changed. I think the field has gotten, once again, a little more contentious. Uh, disputes mm -hmm. have arisen. Um, if, if, and when the first hit, a lot of my clients, you know, for example, uh, whether they be DJs or, or other artists, had maybe a, a, a year long's worth of dates. So one of the key clauses in that, um, in the agreement, which very rarely would get looked at, all of a sudden is like a big issue. The so-called force majeure clause, which is a so-called act of God clause, where, where, where can you can you keep your deposit? How do I deal with the situation now? I can't honor the di the gig. Can we postpone it? Do we have to cancel it? Am I going to be sued? At one point, the courts were even closed. You couldn't sue anyone. Now they're open again, so we we've, we've gone there. So I got a lot of calls, uh, you know, to look at the contracts to see if number one is there a force majeure clause because there are, uh, isn't always, and then if so, how do you interpret it? And there's going to be some really interesting. I would think court cases coming up hmm. because there's going to be money at stake that, that people are looking to say, Hey, I've lost money on this. 
there's going to be a lawsuit that that'll be coming but right for right now it's been a, more an interpretation of that particular clause under an agreement mm -hmm. but i mean that that wasn't happening before um i've seen you know, relationships you know s s you know uh whether it be spouses that are no longer getting along and okay i don't do family law right, right. but there may be a music industry uh, aspect of that because they were a, a partnership that created music mm -hmm. together and how do we divide this now we never had an agreement for, for example right. uh, i mean these things um there are some people still getting signed i just did a deal uh i probably within the last several weeks and uh it was like okay well i'm not gigging so hey this looks like a godsend let's uh let's go ahead i'm now going to be in production and uh i'm going to cut a publishing deal because it's you know i'm not making money live so right, right. i've got an asset that i can i can monetize and mm -hmm. move my career ahead that way so mm -hmm. yeah I, there have been pivots and shifts in the industry for sure no yeah. question yeah there's many artists out there from ages, different ages and stages, and uh, um, so they they're asking, why would I need an entertainment lawyer? What, what would what would I need one for? Um, so, <laughs> so I go into. I love that and, one. <laughs> yeah. So the question that, that that comes to mind for me is, what questions is you as, as a lawyer when you sit down with a client say, first of all, do do you need me? You know. Well, you know what I I I take a lot of pride on that too. Not just whether you need me or what does it cost and uh, if I proceed and um, do I really need to do it? it's not unlike for example going to a mechanic and saying well I could do a b c d e but you really know you only need a and b so that's what I'm going to recommend so I I mean I try and try and do that too and you know form fit to, to the not just the budget but but the, the actual needs and i often say look you may have a, a range of legal issues but you often don't have the budget to pursue them so pick your battles so to speak choose your priorities and let's do one at a time you don't have to do it all at once let's amortize those over time as your business grows but let's right. take care of the ones that are necessary so dale you had asked what what would you need a, a an yeah why would i need it why yeah. would i need an entertainment lawyer in the first place what what would be the reason <laughs> i th i think primarily um in relation to what i do is to get advice on and negotiate and draft and ensure that you get the best deal you can under a contract i have so also it's, heard it's not like it's not like a like like a parachute it's it's more like a an airbag <laughs> <laughs> well i i think if you use lawyers uh, and I'm saying that generically, uh, well, you can actually save yourself a lot of legal headaches and therefore often money and actually make money if a lawyer is used properly. And I'm not saying that's always the case, but, but it can be. So if I negotiate a better deal for you because I know the other side, I know the customs, I know that the offer is not within customs and we can bring it into uh, more acceptable standards, in you know studies have shown that the difference between a negotiated deal and a negotiated deal can make the difference whether you're actually earning royalties under it or not so that that's valuable um i often look at it this way too um people often ask when do you need a lawyer it's not what not just what for right. because i mean obviously if you wanted a trademark or you needed to incorporate you wanted a partnership agreement uh, I said mostly contracts because that's what I see primarily that entertainment law is about. It's what they call the so-called transactional uh, uh, practice of law, meaning deals are being made rather than lit litigation, for example. But I often like to say it's before, during, and after. Okay, before a deal uh, to figure out whether or not the deal's within industry standards or whether it makes sense for you to do the uh, 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 the deal and give yourself i think it i've realized over time that law which is very intangible much like the intellectual property that we deal with you can't taste it you can't feel it you can't even hear it it's an intangible service so it's very hard sometimes to say what is that really worth what is really worth that i've seen in my practice it boils down to three words peace of mind 
mm. that, that you know when you came to someone that n knows what they're doing in the field, that you've given it your best shot and you got the best deal you possibly can given all the, the factors involved, the bargaining power, et cetera. That's what you're paying for. Very yes, good. you're paying for the reputation, the advice and the service. Absolutely. But all boils down to those three little words, so which you, are really important. Yeah, you touched on intellectual property. Now, I was wondering if you might give us a little uh, more of a definition what, when you talk about music registration and getting into intellectual property, for, for our listeners to understand, what does that mean? Yeah, sure. Well, intellectual property is really what I like to consider a family of statutes. The four main ones that you'd be dealing with are clearly the Copyright Act, the Trademarks Act, Industrial Designs Act, and Patents Act. Mm -hmm. there's, there's two others, just to be complete. Uh, the Pro Plant Breeders Protection Act, <laughs> which most people aren't too worried about if they're in music. <laughs> Although you never know, they could have a side business in a new strain of cannabis or whatever. I don't know. Uh, it was quite legal. And uh, the Integrated Circuit Topography Act. Oh, That's man, I've got to write this all down. It's taking people <laughs> crazy. Uh, so if you're not doing uh, integrated circuits, you're probably not doing that either. So let's go back to the other four. Right, yeah. And let's break those down. Right. These are all... Um, statutes that recognize intellectual property as a creation of the mind and protect that. So what each one protects something different. The Copyright Act protects what they call works, W-O-R-K-S, uh, in a particular form of expression, whether it be literary, dramatic, musical, of course, films, videos, video games, etc. You say that in media? That'd be a... Would that be a the way of the media, the form that it's it's in. I'm just trying to sure, think. yeah. Uh, but but the key the key word is it's the the form of expression and a work. Okay. It has to be a work recognized under the Copyright Act. Okay. Um, secondly, trademarks protect um, wares and services in the marketplace that are used in the ordinary course of business that distinguish your wares and services and they're not confusing with another. It can be any combination of a trade name, a trademark, a logo, a slogan, even a sound, uh, or any combination of those that distinguish your wares and services or wares or services. You, you don't have to have both uh, in the marketplace. That's a trademark. Industrial designs, again, we're getting a little more removed because anyone that's in the in music industry is creating copyrights by virtue of creating sound recordings, uh, videos, and of course, music. Right. Everyone has a, usually a business name, but which might also be a trademark and or professional name and or a group name that would be potentially a trademark. Uh, industrial designs protect the aesthetic feature of a design. So if you, I don't know, I like, I like to think of it as uh, a new form of wallpaper, for example. Uh, if you've got a new design that's original within the meaning of the Industrial Designs Act, it, then it can be detected as a, as a, a valuable design or the shape of furniture, the, the shape of a, of a smartphone, uh, et cetera. And it, that's, it's the aesthetic feature, not the industrial part. And lastly, protect, uh, patents protect inventions. Inventions. Um, so those inventions have to be new. In, in the sense that they're unique, never existed before. Unlike copyrights, only have to be original within the Copyright Act, which I'm happy to talk about. But patents only have to be, they have to be unique, uh, i.e. new, useful, and they have to meet a, a definition in law of what they call uh, non-obvious or what they call inventive merit. Okay. So uh, most people aren't necessarily creating p patents in relation to the the work that they do in the music industry. Uh, it's possible. I mean, if you invented a new form of recording or a new f form of guitar or instrument or any, any number of things that might constitute an invention, yes, that's, that's true. But most people are likely within the first two, the Copyright and Trademark Act. That's the main. Uh, intellectual property statutes you'd be looking at. Yeah, okay. Before I turn it over to Cheryl, I want to just do a little commercial here. I want to remind everybody we're watching <coughs> the MI Hub online. 
We have Paul Sanderson here, entertainment lawyer in Ontario, and we are so glad to have him as we we're just going through some questions and getting some incredible uh, deep answers, and we hope that it's a benefit to you. And if you're enjoying this, we ask you to share this. Tell, you, tell people about it and uh, go to our channel on YouTube, GMI Hub Online, and check out our resource of great videos we have there. By the way, I've got my reading glasses on today, just in case I have to read something. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm normally like this. <laughs> I guess it looks more scholarly. You look more like a lawyer. <laughs> With the COVID ha haircut, of case. Yeah, or, lack, or lack thereof. <laughs> Oh, my barber's not going to be very happy with you. <laughs> Seven months later. Yeah. Okay. Well, All in good well, time. Paul, <laughs> well, Paul, I did have a, a question, kind of going a little bit deeper into the agreement. So I'm, I'm glad you went through the overview. And I'm thinking about the actual artists themselves who may be um, either thinking about having to enter an agreement or they've been approached with an agreement. And what are some things that they should should be aware of before they enter a, an agreement with anybody like, and uh, i don't know if it's terminologies or what what are some things you would advise them to be aware of uh, that's, that's a good question I, I like to start actually from a non-legalistic uh, approach on that i'm a firm believer in what i call the relationship theory of contracts so no matter what contract you're entering into whether it's a publishing agreement or a recording agreement or a collaboration agreement with a co-writer of songs or a producer agreement there has to be some relationship there and, and ideally at least uh, a basis of trust in that relationship so if you're already feeling like you don't trust someone then you may consider <laughs> that this is not the, the way you want to go with it because so, you and, and a lot of these agreements do Cheryl they last a long time if you're signing a record deal that could be your your foreseeable future and career all in one agreement especially if there are options like there often are for multiple records often albums worth may, maybe as many as uh, uh, one firm album plus four options you're up to five albums sometimes those options can take anywhere up to say three years to exercise so you know if you if you exercise them all it's 15 years lots of artists don't have careers that last any more than two to three years if they're fortunate so you want to be careful on the other hand i also often say look treat every agreement seriously it may be the only one you ever get so to figure out whether you want to enter in at, at that level of the industry based on those terms or not so th that's another thing the other thing you look at so the th third one i would say is bargaining power what does that mean it really is it, it depends uh on the situation but what ability do you have to negotiate those terms what leverage do you have how desirable are you to be signed to that third party who, whoever it may be or whoever so um and and then you look at that in relation to industry standards and customs and then make your best shot. I guess the good news in, in the music industry, and I think a lot of the arts, uh, when you are presented with an agreement, certainly in our jurisdiction, and it can vary, and because there are differences, even though this is a global industry, which it really is, uh, there are cultural and different industry practices that can affect these deals, even though they look very similar. <laughs> uh, in practice, they may be interpreted as slightly different and what may be acceptable industry practice in Korea is not the same as in Ontario or out of Nashville, for example. I'm just using three different jurisdictions. Uh, so you want to be sensitive to that. On the other hand, there, there are a lot of terminology that are usable and um, that will apply on a worldwide basis. So... Um, I, I would keep keep those in mind too. The good news is, like I was saying there, <clears throat> they are you're expected if you once you receive the initial draft, it is usually a first draft that's negotiable, and that's a good thing. That's where, thank goodness, because if it was just if they were all, uh, you know, presented on a take or to leave it business, I don't think I'd be in business. That would be it. 
Uh, but fortunately, that isn't usually the case. I mean, there are some exceptions. If you're walking into like a contest, for example, for one of these uh, TV shows that that, that is, uh, for example, you're, you're on a talent show, you're likely not going to have a lot of bargaining power and it's either take it or leave it. There's a word for that in law. It's called contracts of adhesion. Mm. You know, it was a cattle call, so to speak. Right. And I use that loosely. You you answered the call. You signed the deal. You can get advice on it, mm -hmm. but we're not going to change it right. for you. So so that's an exception. For in most cases, if it's a private uh, contract with a, a record label or a publisher, that's a first draft. You're entitled to get advice on it. You're entitled to say, hey, I would like to make a counter offer. I think this advance is a little s too small. These royalties could be improved, or maybe we can get some increases based on some success like sales plateaus. Those are very common negotiable issues and you should raise. And, and thankfully, you're expected to raise those. <laughs> you can expect that it's a first offer that is in the favor of whoever made that, not your favor necessarily. So those are good things to keep in mind. Yeah. Yeah. Now you mentioned that you had, uh, and and we, I'd love to be able to use this resource for our, our viewers on our website. Um, you have a, a kind of a list of what artists should look for, and you said it's in the form of the word create or creative. I oh, believe. Oh, creating. Yes. Okay. Uh, let me yeah. direct you to it. Uh, if you go to the uh, alasontario.ca website and scroll down. Uh, under recent articles, it uh, it is there, and I'm I'm proud of that because that's something that has evolved over years, and the good news is it was a collaborative effort too, cause, which I don't usually do, but uh, it's been vetted by four other lawyers on the board, so it better be it better be good. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, and it's something that evolved out of my teaching. I went, gee, this is interesting. So, so for example, what does C stand for? Well. Copyright, compensation, okay, good. What does R stand for? Well, it stands for things like um, revo revocability or, or residuals, for example. What does E stand for? Well, is it an exclusive deal or is it not an exclusive deal? What does T stand for, right? Um, I, I skipped ahead. A would be an accounting and audit clause, the, the financial side of the agreement. The double T would be uh, term. How long does it last? The territory? How does it apply worldwide, or is it Canada only, or is it North America? I is it, are the rights granted on an irrevocable basis? N is it non-exclusive, or if there's a definition of net receipts, what are they? And lastly, but not least, G. What are the grant of rights that you're expected to give up under this agreement? So, I mean, it goes into much more detail than that, but that's that's a that's a highlight of what you might think. There's even at the end there, Cheryl, uh, with uh, what Marion added as an editor, she added what's called the mother goose rhyme. She tried to make these into a little <laughs> poem, if you will, that could, you, you could recite to remember them. But anyway, it's something that involved out of my teaching and practice. And I, I thought it would be uh, useful to, you know, put, put more uh, detail on it in an article. So there it is for the world to use. That's, that's great. And those little rhymes are good for helping people. Yes, to yes. Them. So yes. there's nothing, nothing to be afraid of or ashamed of. I mean, that's really cool. So I, should, that, I, I, I should go in, Dale, and, and try, <laughs> try and memorize it. <laughs> I could have used it today. So go, wow, uh, poet. Alasontario.ca. Um, yes. Go into that. Side. So that's, that's Artist Learning Advice Services. Is that correct? Oh, Artist Legal advice Legal services. Advice services. Yeah, there you yes. go, folks. Look into that. Yes. Yeah, by, by all means. Yeah, that's what it's there for. There are some re resources on that website. If you're also interested for from more um, immediately accessible uh, articles, you can go to my website, too. And I have a, about a handful of two to three minute podcasts on you know, management deals, record deals, publishing, some general questions you're welcome to, to, to look at that. And there's some articles that I've written over the years that have posted there that might be of some interest too. Uh, mm -hmm. Paul, that's uh, sandersonlaw.ca. Excellent. We will certainly do that. I think that would be of great value to everybody. Um, I guess another question I had, which you may have already answered, I was going to think about little terminologies. I, ah. 
are there certain terms that artists should be aware of, if, if I can call it legalese, you know, that artists should be aware of, especially if they're not familiar with um, the agreement, how it's written out, that um, if they're not aware of it, it could actually lead to something that they, they don't want to agree to. Are there any terms uh, or phrases that they should be aware of? Many, many. Uh, like most uh, industries, uh, the music industry has its own terminology or often what I like to think as jargon, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. idiosyncratic to this industry. So if I said pipeline income, black box payments, cross collateralization, you go, huh? Yeah. What's that? <laughs> all the terms of, all, yeah, all terms of art within, within the music industry, all of which have their meaning in, in context, right? Or, you know, even advances, what are they? What are royalties? How do you calculate royalties? Mm -hmm. um, the good news is, as I mentioned, not just in my books uh, or book, um, there are other books out there. I highly recommend um, a book by Donald Passman, who's a, uh, a US attorney, been uh, practicing for many years, probably even longer than me who represents many well-known people, including people like Taylor Swift. He writes a book about every two, three years and updates it. There is a Canadianized version of it. And if you're looking at a business book that, uh, and, and you know, cause it is American centric, but there is, like I said, look for the Canadian version. Um, and it'll give you a pretty good uh, idea of what, how the industry is working and uh, on a f pretty up-to-date basis. So uh, the good news is there, there's resources out there and good ones that you can, um, you know, long after I've finished speaking, you can go and look at and, and get some really good advice from. The other thing, and of course I'm biased, but I have been teaching for a while. I just find as well, uh, let, let me give an example. My students in, in 11 months at the Metalworks Institute will go through about six months of intellectual property law and about five months of contracts that are specific to this field. If you go through that, you're gonna be miles ahead of a client that comes into my office that says, oh, by the way, I have a management agreement, I have a record production agreement and a publishing agreement. And they've never even cracked a book or had any in, you know, it's like me doing trying to do a crash course often on reduced fees, because <laughs> we're working with artists, right? <laughs> uh, or flat fees, it, 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 you know, in two to three hours that it would take me 11 months to really do. So you ought to yourself, if you're in the field, to get at least know the basics. I mean, you need to know some basics about copyright. You don't, you don't have to be a lawyer, but you, the better, um, better advised you are, the more apt you are to instruct your own team and you will need a team including your own lawyer and make better decisions and save money in the long run so if you're serious about it you need to know some of the business i don't i mean if you're this way this way if you're in a group and someone's more business minded than you are i understand so that that may it may fall to someone in the group and that's fine too um but at least learn some of the basics you know i i for example can you and this happens and I'm not doing this to be judgmental at all. In fact, as a lawyer, you learn over the years, you just deal with the facts as they come in the door. You can scratch your head all you want to figure out how it happened. It's not going to change them, right? So, but but someone comes into my office at, at my hourly rate, which is substantial, not the most, but not the least either, right? It's a substantial lawyer's fee and asks me what a mechanical license is. I'm going... I'll answer that question, but you could have come in with a question beyond that <laughs> that, would, that wouldn't have cost you my hourly rate to answer something that you probably should have had at least some basic knowledge on. Again, I'm not here to judge, but if you want to pay my hourly rate right. to answer the basics, go ahead. Yeah, but I think that you're right. You could take the time to research yeah. that and find it quite accessible on the internet yeah. or whatever yeah. to get to that same answer. But where you would come into play is when take that into the application of their particular right. situation. 
Yes, yes. And that's what I'm saying. And that's where I'd rather be, too. After 37 years, you go, okay. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I will answer all the questions as they come. I'm just saying, is that a cost-effective way to use your counsel monetarily? Probably not. But, you know, some people don't have the time and it's not, we're not always talking about artists. Some people. But for me, know, it wouldn't, yeah. it wouldn't be that. For me, it would be my headspace. I probably wouldn't be uh, able to comprehend or go there. I, maybe someone else is in the same position where they're like, that's just beyond me. I, you know, so. Yeah. That, yeah. <clears throat> no, don't get me wrong. And I know, I know, I, and I've said this before and, and it, it bears repeating. Some people are much more right brain centric. Some people are much more less brain centric. And I know there's some creative geniuses out there. You would never, wouldn't dare put them behind a car to drive, <laughs> but you put a guitar in front of them and man, that's, that's where they're at home. But don't ask them to about the con, you know, the details of a contract either, because that's the analytical side of your brain. And I know there are theories that there's, there's, you meet in between. That's true but you're often one of the other centric. So if you're that, if you're that creatively oriented, yeah, you may not be the one to do that. Then make sure someone around you, your manager, counsel, your team, your other bandmates can help. So well, you'll be, you can, there's where you can be taken advantage of. And that's, that's a shame. Yeah, no, very true. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about the scenario that I brought up in the very beginning. Um, there have been artists, no, artist A um, goes to producer or production uh, studio, um, records their music, you know, it's really good recording. Some time passes by and the artist is asked to, to perform and they, they say, oh, great, I can perform. I just need to get the backing tracks. And when they try to contact that same studio, for some reason that studio ups and seems to be non-existent. They can't get a hold of the producer or they get a hold of that person, that producer or studio, and they say, no, those are mine. And I know you've talked about intellectual property. Uh -huh. So being specific to that situation, an artist that may have been in that, that, that may have encountered that, um, is there A, anything that they can do um, to retrieve or change that intellectual property so it's back to them having the right to get that music without having to pay an enormous amount of money for example um that's the a and the b to that is to uh, what can they do to avoid that happening again to them <laughs> <laughs> it's a very complicated question uh and i will unbundle that as best i can and if, you know, if i can remember all the aspects to it um it's very common as well. And as I mentioned before, if you can be proactive and I know this is a cliche, but you can live by this one. It's one of the, it's one of the things I say in my classes. If you remembered nothing <laughs> from what I said, get it in writing. So this is a scenario where that's very good advice. The, the other two things I often say is uh, it depends which means it depends on the facts because the, the facts are often what, and I like to quote this from the, the late great Mahatma Gandhi because I read his autobiography. He says, the facts are three quarters of the law. So who am I to argue? That often is the case. And lastly, you don't get what you deserve. You get what you negotiate. So those three things, if you can, you can live by those and yes, get in right. So let's go back to your scenario. And I, I want to make sure I've got the facts right, because it, I, I think I do. So an artist has worked with a producer. It sounds like, from the facts, there's nothing in writing, probably. We're making that assumption. If there is, then you go immediately to the contract to see what might have been agreed upon and how you could interpret that and how you might work in relation to that contract. But let's assume now, because there is no indication of a written agreement, the, the artist hired a producer in their studio don't know if they were paid. It sounds like they may or may not have been. Not sure, because that's a factor too. So we've got a number of uh, rights here. And um, am I reading correctly, or not reading, um, or reading into it correctly, Cheryl, that there was some collaboration with the producer on the songwriting as well? 
Um, there could have been. Uh, yeah. The scenarios that I've heard of, I, they've not made that clear to me. Sure. I've just heard that they basically they were on the produ production side. That's the only thing I've heard. Right. Okay. So uh, it's not unusual for a producer to either write or co-write mm -hmm. and, and or uh, ask for a percentage of publishing, mostly because um, <clears throat> it's very difficult to sell records these days. We're 85% of the world market and it's now into streaming. And as we all know, streaming pays about an average of about 0, 004 cents per stream. So it's really hard to to, to justify any substantial studio bill by way of sales, if you will, because most artists are not going to recoup their costs, recoupment meaning earning back, right? Their costs through those sales. Uh, so produce, I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but in the past producers would not have been asking as consistently they are now for a percentage either of the copyright and the publishing, which means the copyright to the music that's being recorded and or a percentage of, of revenue from that source. Music tends to have a little more um, possibility that their revenue will be earned. So so let's, let's step back. Now let's look at the intellectual property side of it. There are three, right? Three main rights here. And one of them often gets very much overlooked. We know there's rights in the recording. There's a copyright in the recording. So the issue on the facts that you've raised is uh, who owns that recording? And I'll just pay, pose that as an issue now. Secondly, the, the copyright in the songs, who owns them? And if they were solely written versus co-written, different scenarios, right? So we'll comment on those. And then lastly, and this is the one that is uh, often overlooked, ever since 1997 under our Copyright Act, um, there are rights that are called neighboring rights. Those rights exist in a master and they exist in performances in the master. So think of it this way, that third copyright, if you will, particularly with respect to performers' rights in their performances is a separate work. So there's three separate works, songs or music, if you will, uh, <clears throat> the sound recording and the performance in the sound recording, three separate sets of rights, three separate sources of revenue. So the third one often gets overlooked because we, we assume that the recording and the uh, the neighboring rights are merged and they exist intangibly in the same recording, but they are separate in law. Okay, so now we're in a situation where to move the facts scenario ahead, your artist wanted to re uh, wanted a copy of the recording so they could perform maybe even on a television track or live to, to, to track, for example, oh, very common. <clears throat> and under a lot of producer deals, which is what we're talking about here, uh, a deal with a producer in a studio, uh, presumably if you paid for that, you would own that as well. And often producers are asked to do multiple mixes. The so-called TV mix is really just the mix with the vocals left off so that you can do a live vocal performance to a track. And that's very common. Um, so now in, the, in our scenario, we don't really have anything in writing. So <laughs> I don't know whether the producer has been paid. Uh, maybe they have, maybe they haven't. Um, if, if, they were, if they were paid, that, that would create an argument that the copyright to that master was expected to be acquired by the artist. But again, in the absence of a written agreement, it can be pretty vague. And and if the producer wasn't paid <clears throat> and they were sitting on the, the masters, if you will, or the recordings, or even by now might have destroyed them, what, I mean, they're not there. So what, what would the artist do? I guess they'd have a right to sue them. But in the absence of a written agreement, it's going to be pretty hard to prove that they had a right to own it or whether they even paid to own it. So, yeah, in this scenario, and lastly, I think if if the artist was recording, and we're assuming this, and, and that may not be the case, maybe they're recording a cover version, but we're assuming they're recording their own music that they own or have co-written and co-owned with someone else, 
maybe even the producer. They would have the right to to prevent the pro producer from releasing the tracks because they would the producer um, in order, let's say, to recoup studio costs, for example, the producer would need a mechanical license from the other owner or co-owners of the, the music. Otherwise, it's an infringement of copyright in the music. But you couldn't really exploit the master either without um, uh, having the producer at least agree to that, even something simple like an, an email. But ideally, you'd have in this scenario, and I deal with these all the time, literally all the time, um, you engage the producer, you should at least have a deal memo in place, something in writing. And I keep saying something in writing is better than nothing. I de even exchange of emails is better than nothing. It's at least, at least it's in writing that it, it indicates the intent. Ideally, it would be a, a more formal, and th they don't have to be particularly long form. You know, it's not, the, not as if it has to be a 20 page written agreement, but something in writing that confirms the rights with you and the producer who owns what, what, you, what can you do with these masters? and and if there is a collaboration in terms of the songs, a, a, a songwriter collaboration, which again would explain how you would be able to um, exploit the songs with or without consent. Because otherwise, these copyrights in the songs, uh, especially under, under a collaboration agreement, tend to be jointly owned. And even if you have only 1% of a song, the consent is required under our Copyright Act from the other 99% holder and vice versa. Otherwise, you're infringing the rights because you now have a work that was a, that 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 where the copyright is merged, and um, you have an underrighted right of that even of that one percent in the entire whole. So you have the right to say no. You can't use it that way. You can't put it in that film. You can't you can't release it on the sound recording. Why? Because I don't want you to. So that's why it's vitally important to get things in writing um, yeah. to, a, to a degree that then you'll have that uh, control, not necessarily control, but you'll have the ability to, uh, to do what you need to do to yeah. stop people from using, utilizing it. You can it. set out what your respective rights are and who owns it. That's another thing. I, if this was a producer spec deal, it's quite common for producers to own those masters until they're paid their fee. So that would also include not just the, the right to possess the physical master, you know whether it be digital or, or physical um, but the actual uh, right in that case to uh, to the copyright as well no I know that in, in the yeah. past I, I knew a friend of mine who's in a band they were very popular but when they went to get the masters they were unable to because the record label uh, and the contract had stipulated that they owned them mm. and to the to the ignorance of, of the guys they, they signed the contract all excited about being on a label it's great you know so <laughs> And yeah. and they didn't go over well they, they did go over it but they didn't think about it being a, 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 the repercussions of, of this uh, sometime down the line so this is like twenty years later they're like I, oh, oh, you know I gotta share this with you Dale on that note I'm a big fan of reading uh, biographies and autobiographies if you want to read one of the worst scenarios I've ever read about artist contracts and I've read lots uh, read. Uh, John Fogarty's book, his autobiography called Fortunate Son, an absolute disaster of a deal. Signed on the back of a car with no independent legal advice. To this day, he doesn't own his songs and, and you can well imagine how valuable those songs would be. At one point in the late 60s, the Creedence Clearwater Revival, which was the band he was in, were outselling the Beatles. Wow. <laughs> yes, and, uh, and and the book is just, I mean, it, it really, for many years, it, it caused some deep depression, and he couldn't even tour. Uh, so, yeah, it, 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 you, you owe it to yourself to, like I said, go back to the peace of mind concept and mm -hmm. do the best you can. And who knows? It, it may not have been that much of a difference, but it's funny, in the day, a well-known artist manager was managing the Beatles and the Stones he went to him and this is evident in the book he went to him and said his name was Alan Klein right who was known to be a great deal maker and he looked at him and said I can't do anything with this 
it was that bad. It's like, wow. oh boy. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyway, if you want to know more about that, it's uh, Man, there's lots of no, stories out there. I'm sure. Like, well, the, yeah, it, the Bay City Rollers had a raw deal as well. There's so many things. Yeah, the, it, I just read uh, Bruce Springsteen's "Born to Run." Mm -hmm. He had he had his he was out of the marketplace for about two and a half years, not able to tour, and and he was suing his former production company manager uh, and publisher. Oh yeah. Many hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal fees later, he, yeah. he was fortunate. <laughs> he, he still had a career, but <laughs> other people might not have. Not so, yeah. So hey, I want to just remind everybody you're listening to GMI Hub Online, and we're talking about legal matters when it comes to entertainment lawyer Paul Sanderson. We're so glad to have him with us today. And thank you for watching. If you have a chance to share this experience with those who are also maybe interested in this, uh, please go to GMI Hub Online, our YouTube channel, and check out all our different videos we have up there for you as well. Paul, you've answered a whole lot of my questions, because um, the next question I had was, on what grounds do people sue one another? And you just gave some great examples of, of that. Um, have you had to deal with some very, mm, I guess, crazy situations where uh, you had to you had to take a situation to a court of law, or, or you, for the most part, I know you said earlier that you try to avoid the the courts uh, system. So, um, what what about in your thirty seven years of experience? Have you had to deal with any worst case scenarios? Uh, yes, uh, uh, I have to be careful here because yeah, uh, confi no <laughs> yes, yes. No confidential no is, is going running through the, my head going, uh, careful, Paul, you're a lawyer. Here. <laughs> confidential is paramount. Um, yes, we have. I, what I've tended to do because we I like to see ourselves as on the building side of the industry and the deal makers. Um, when it gets too contentious, um, I will f refer it to a litigation lawyer. And, and you're probably best to do that because not only do they enjoy litigating, which I do not, uh, mm -hmm. they are experienced at it and maybe even experts at it. So why would you put someone who would be dabbling up against someone who isn't? You're best to go with someone who, who does that for their living and it, you know, have some expertise in it. We have occasionally been what I call co-counsel on some files, uh, but never on the record. So you won't know if I'm behind that. Co coaching the barrister who knows nothing about the industry and needs to know because it's very complicated and it, it, it's, it's quite idiosyncratic the way it might be interpreted. And and you can't expect a judge necessarily to understand the way the industry works either. I, I like to say it this way, and it's, it is true. <clears throat> when you read a, a music industry agreement, sometimes uh, you think you understand what it says, and maybe you do. But if you don't know the industry behind it, often what's not in there is even more important than what's in there. That's kind of scary, isn't it? It's like, well, wait a minute. It's not a slate of hand. It's just the way it's just the way it's structured. Uh, you know, by way of example, for example, uh, you may be sharing in, in, for example, net receipts. Well, that has an interpretation in, in, in the industry. Now, the question, a technical question would be, does that include advances? Right. Maybe not. And and if if you're working with a small production company that then licenses to a larger company that collects a major advance, what does the artist get of that? Well, if it says net earned royalties, actually earned received, nothing. That's an interpretation, right? That because advances are not earned and received. They are only credited. There are prepayment of royalties. So there's an example, like you really have to know the way the industry works and the way the language is and go through that in some detail. So the, the sharing of advances issue, or like I said, it's a global industry. So if, uh, lots, of, uh, lots of companies go to um, third parties outside of Canada and do 
collect advances and give rights away to sell in in other territories. Um, but the artist may not see any of that and may not be legally entitled to contractually. Hmm. But hmm. Uh, I think I got off on track on that, Cheryl, because you wanted some crazy examples. Well, <laughs> That's not well, so crazy. Well, actually, but there. <laughs> but I got off um, on a tangent, yeah. Um, have we been involved in a litigious situation? Yes, most of them I, I'm able, unfortunately, um, and the parties come to their senses, when, especially when you start to spend money and you start to realize that I could be spending more on my lawyer than, than it's worth. And then they often come to their financial senses and go, okay, it's not worth dragging into court. Um, f I guess fortunately in Canada, I haven't seen a lot of, um, a lot of litigation. Um, a lot of our contract uh, litigation precedents come from England I mean, there's a lot of high profile cases there. For example, cases involving Fleetwood Mac, Elton John, uh, you know, just about every major artist signed, a, you know, the, the Who signed their deals when they were coming off stage and <sighs> litigation down the road, you know, right? like they didn't read it, mm. you know, and, 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 and out of the States. So, uh, and there, there tends to be a lot more money when you're litigating there. I mean, someone like George Michael too, spent about probably about four or five million dollars trying to sue his record label and destroying his career in the in the process. He lost actually. You don't always lose, but it, it, you put a lot at stake. And a lot of artists can't afford to get into the litigation ring because, like I said, if you only have a two to three year window, and a lot of artists don't really understand that. It's really hard to be, you know, have a be a catalog artist like a, you know, Springsteen, Madonna, Stones, Beatles. Those are exceptions, exceptional exceptions. So most artists have a two to three year window. So how can you afford to waste time litigating or be tied up under a contract and in court? There's your career that's it's, it's gone. So the, there's a lot of pressure uh, to settle, and the, the labels know that too, right? Um, that, and I, I don't, not just to blame labels, that is, I don't want to say that, but right, right. The, the bargaining power there is pretty obvious. Uh, if you're about to sue a multi-billion dollar company and you're a small artist with very little means to do so, you don't have a lot of bargaining power. That's the way it goes, right? Yeah. That's the way the litigation system works. Hmm. It's pay to play and it's expensive. Hmm. And whoever can last the longest usually wins. I didn't make the rules. <laughs> I'm just observing. <laughs> anyway, you want to try to stay away from that if you can. Go work with good people, yeah. right? Have good relationships and uh, check them out before you sign with them. Speak to other artists that are on uh, that they're, that have, have have done, you know, contracts with them and find out what their re reputation is. Is, is. is it any different than, you know, checking someone's references if you're hiring them as an employee or an employer, for example? No, it's the same. You're you're entitled to do that. You mm -hmm. should do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, for sure. Yeah. No, that's wonderful. I, I, when you gave that last example, I was thinking that's an example of something uh, about the advance. Uh, I, I, sorry, I didn't coin the the phrase right, <laughs> but advances. Yeah, the advances, and that is something that you know something that can be written there and. Yes. Sorry, it makes me it makes me think of the, the a comedy show where, um, where uh, someone would say, "Well, I'll get my fifty percent, and I'll even do better. I'll give you the fifty percent of your fifty percent of your fifty percent." It's one of those. It's one of those uh, kind of phrases where people think they're getting more because it's said more or it's written ah. in a certain way. Actually, oh, it's yes. actually <laughs> the other way around, right? <laughs> That's what it came across. I, like, so I, I can show you some some arithmetic like that, Cheryl, where wh that proves your point. <laughs> uh, yeah, if you want to hear it, it's it's how, sure. that, how can a how can a fifty fifty deal be better than a seventy five twenty five deal? Mm. <laughs> I'm asking rhetorically, but but can it? Yes, it can. <laughs> but how? Any idea? I. <laughs> okay. Is it, is it, is it rhetorical? <laughs> what, what are they referring to? The royalty fees or the sales? What is the the fifty fifty? Uh, yeah, royalties. Let's. Uh, it's in the publishing world. So a fifty fifty publishing deal, a so called 
full publishing deal where, so, where the publisher owns half the copyright and uh, sorry, owns 100% of the copyright mm -hmm. and they sh the writer and the publisher share equally in the uh, net receipts. So the publisher's share is 50% of net receipts. The, uh, the, the writer gets their 50% of net receipts. But they also get publishing too, don't they? Only under a co-publishing. So if you're under right. a co-publishing deal, so uh, then you would own the copyright typically. And again, this is negotiable, but most of them are, you own half the copyright and you get half the publisher's share of income. So you can, now you're getting a 75-25 split. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But hear me out on this. <laughs> Here's where 50-50 could actually be a better deal. If you were being paid what's called at source, right? At source means typically in a foreign territory, you're guaranteed 50%, your 50%, your writer's share at source with no deductions. On a non-at source deal that's 75-25, if the sub publisher takes, uh, let's say, I don't know, 40%. So you now have a 60 cent dollar and now you're getting 75, 25 of 60 cents. What does that amount to? It's like 45, 15, yeah, right? About 45, yeah. So now I'm, my, at, my at source deal is worth 50 cents on the dollar and your mm -hmm. 75, 25 deal mm -hmm. is only worth 45. Right. So I'm in better, I'm in better shape. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Presto changeo. Magic. <laughs> Poof. <laughs> so it's all in the wording, right? Yeah. So there you go. It, you, you have to be careful. You're right. It, you have to look very carefully at the way the deals are stru structured. And those are, those are, that's not a slate of hand. It, that, that's just, that's just in the language, right? And those right. are industry practices that you need to be aware of. You know, we're talking about the legal jargon earlier, and this is yeah. kind of that category where you're kind of falling into the numbers game. And it's, yeah. it can, sometimes it just can be beyond your mindset. Um, before we draw our time to, to, to close, I want to remind everybody about Artist Legal Advice Services. It's um, alasontario.ca. Uh, Paul Sanderson's worked so hard with his team to get this uh, together as a resource for, for you as an artist. It's all the legal things you need to worry about. It's there at alasontario.ca. Thank you, Thank Paul, you. Yes. so much yeah. for bringing that to our conversation today. You're welcome. You're welcome. We <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Paul, I basically just want to thank you so much for sharing, sharing your wisdom and sharing... Um, I'll say this, anybody who's watching this video right now is more empowered by what they know listening to you than they were when they first hit the uh, record button <laughs> or, the, or the listening button. To be honest with you, I'm even learning more. I've learned so much jargon and I think I'll be asking you some more <laughs> stuff. <laughs> I'll be calling me, Paul, well, what does this mean? <laughs> well, yeah. By all means, look me up. Thank you so much and viewers we thank you for tuning in with us um make sure that you subscribe if you haven't already make sure that you subscribe to this channel and ring the bell so you can be notified of other videos that are being presented right here to help you in your musical journey uh we will be back next week and i don't want to forget to say this happy thanksgiving because that's when we're right. going to be broadcasting this happy thanksgiving enjoy right. the rest of your thanksgiving uh, weekend and uh again we will be back next week take care and Bye-bye. Yeah, yes. remember that GMI encourages unity, community, mentorship, and talent growth. And we just want you to go to GMI Hub online, online and check out all our videos there. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you, Dale and Cheryl. Thank you. If you want me back, anytime. I'd love to have you. Yay. All right. <laughs> Very nice.